greet you in the name of Christ, our Lord, who's the head of the church and counted a joy to be with you. I love your pastor and his dear wife, and I counted a joy to receive this invitation from him, and it's nice to see y'all together. The last time I was here, we were socially distanced and we were inside and outside, which is great for me because I always choose outside, but I know for some of you all, you don't have the love affair with humidity that I have. And so (laughs) it's not always your great joy. And so it is just good to be here. I bring you greetings from South Florida at Family Church, and uh, our vision is to take the gospel to every person in every neighborhood in South Florida. And so you pray for us, and uh, we will pray for you. And uh, one of my teammates is uh, Jimmy Scroggins, and uh, his son Isaac is here, and he is a member here, and I'm delighted anytime I can see family. And so we're thankful for him, plus... I just like young guys because they just remind me of when I didn't have ball spots. And uh, Isaac's head looks good, <laughs> nice and fluffy. Yeah. <laughs> Let me invite you to turn to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. Pastor Ronnie is a dear brother, uh, but he's a funny little something because... Uh, He didn't give me the easiest text out of Matthew 5 through 7. He got me good. And I know uh, Brother Todd, your state exec who was here last week, and I told him I would fix up whatever he messed up last week. And so I have quite a challenge before me. Judge not that you be not judged. (laughs) I don't know if you discovered in talking with unbelievers, every person knows that verse. (laughs) Like people who have never seen a Bible in their life know that verse. (laughs) How in the world you know that? (laughs) I mean, my drunk, weed-smoking, incomprehensive cousin knows that verse. (laughs) But a verse out of context is a setup for a mistake. And so let me read the whole passage, the paragraph, the thought. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It doesn't say don't judge, but you need to do some things before you judge. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. The modern translations, they don't do as good as the King James I grew up on. King James says, don't cast your pearls before swine. When I was a teenager, swine sounded nasty. Don't cast your pearls. But it's really funny because I'm probably one of the most swiney guys in the Southern Baptist Convention. 
pork chops, bacon, sausage, ribs. It's all good to go. Mm. Matthew's gospel is written to a largely Jewish audience who would have been familiar with the law of Moses and the prophets. As a matter of fact, they would have considered themselves the possessors of Moses' law and the prophets. And yet they would have been nominal possessors of that law and the prophets, many of them lacking genuine righteousness and some of them, particularly too many of their leaders, actually being characterized by religious hypocrisy. Hypocrisy doesn't mean you're imperfect. Hypocrisy means you are acting or pretending to be something other than what you are. Condemning things that you yourself do as if you don't do those things. And so Jesus here is rebuking hypocrisy in how they judge other people. It's particularly important that it comes here in Matthew's gospel because 80% of the New Testament usages of the word hypocrisy happen in Matthew's gospel. Where there may be one mention in Mark or one mention in Luke, they're like 12 to 14 mentions in Matthew's gospel. Because again, this audience, they possess the law, they possess the word, so they consider themselves the people of God. Or in their language, we are the sons of Abraham. And yet Jesus says, some of y'all are hypocrites. That's what you are. Earlier he said, some of y'all look good on the outside, but on the inside you're full of dead man's bones. That's a harsh critique. As a matter of fact, in the Gospels, Jesus' harshest encounters are not with demon-possessed people. Jesus' harshest encounters are not with people caught in sin. Jesus' harshest encounters are not with pagans. Jesus' harshest encounters are with religious hypocrites. And that's who he's poking at here. When I was a child in Washington, D.C. in the 70s, it just amazed me that Theologically liberal people who question the authority of Scripture, they like the Sermon on the Mount, particularly they like the Beatitudes. They used to think, oh, that was such poetic language. And it's one of the sharpest critiques that Jesus provides. And so let's hear that critique. Uh, let's feel that critique. This kind of text you have preached when you got somebody else preaching, so... You ain't got to do it. Yeah, Pastor Ronnie, he's a slick brother. Uh, <laughs> the hypocrite undercuts Christianity. In Romans 2, Paul quotes a combination of Isaiah and Ezekiel, and he says, hypocrites sometimes make God's name be mocked among unbelievers. Because we say, God said this, and this is God's standard, and this is God's standard, and I love the Lord, and the Lord has changed me, and I'm a follower of God, I'm a child of God. And then when unbelievers see us do the same things they do and do it unrepentantly or do it in a hypocritical way where we know we do it, but we're trying to hide that we do it, it messes up the testimony of the gospel. The testimony of the gospel is undercut by religious hypocrites. We're very well familiar, many of us, with Paul's critique of a pagan world that rejects the general revelation of creation in Romans chapter 1 and worship is, worships the created things rather than the creator. And God gives them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are unprofitable. And we read that and we say, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Romans 1 talks about a pagan world that gets the consequences of rejecting God. Ah, but Romans 2 
talks about a religious world, particularly the descendants of Jacob who supposedly possessed the law of God, and it talks about how their unrighteousness is just as unrighteousness of the pagans who reject the general revelation of God because they reject the special revelation of God in his law, and not only do they reject it, the pagans are like, hey, we don't follow God. They are hypocrites because they say they follow God, and yet they don't follow God. He says, not only do you stink, do you, are you a stench of unrighteousness, you, you stink worse than the world. And that's not strange for us. We heard Paul tell the Corinthians, y'all are nasty. Y'all do some stuff that even the pagans don't do. So this is a critique on the inside. Listen to Paul's exaltation and critique of the Roman church. Therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you judge, you the judge, practice the very same things. You can't call people out for stuff you do. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, oh man, just because you're religious and you wear church clothes, do you suppose that you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourselves, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? That you will escape? Or do you presume on the riches of the kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because you of your hard and impenitent heart are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed? And then he says in verse 11 of chapter 2 in Romans, God does not show partiality. He doesn't judge the irreligious differently than he judges the religious. He says further in verse 13, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who are justified. There's no righteous standing with God just by saying, I'm in a church that preaches the word. Our first core value at family church is teach the Bible. There's no righteousness just being a member of a church whose first core value is teach the Bible if you don't obey the Bible, if you don't believe the Bible. External religiosity does not earn righteousness with God. So the Bible says God is not a respecter of persons. The Bible says God's not impressed just because you have 18 Bibles on your coffee table. And then in Romans 2, 21 to 24, he says, I know you don't tell people to not commit adultery and you commit adultery. I know you don't tell people don't lie and then you lie. I know you don't tell people don't to not steal and then you steal. He says, because of your hypocrisy, the name of God is blasphemed among unbelievers. The Bible rails against religious hypocrites who in the Old Testament claim the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but don't obey him. And in the New Testament, claim to be followers of Jesus Christ and don't obey him. <laughs> My late pastor used to say, if God could be confused, we would confuse him. He said, because Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do the things I say unto you. So here in this beautiful Sermon on the Mount, and it is literarily beautiful. It is a wonderful articulation, but it has a lot of bite to it. Jesus is condemning hypocritical judgment. So let us be careful to exercise godly judgment in ways that are not hypocritical. Let us be careful to exercise godly judgment in ways that are not hypocritical. So we need to avoid two things. One, again, let me read that language in verse two. 
For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Let us avoid applying uneven scales to people. Let us avoid having different standards for different people. God's word is the same, and we ought to use his word the same to engage all kinds of people. We ought not have a righteous and a godly standard we use for other people in a different standard we use for ourselves. Y'all ever seen people when someone falls or someone's overtaken in a fault, they like, uh, 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 uh. And then if they sin or if they fall, they up here in y'all face, oh, brothers and sisters, can you have mercy on me? Why you want mercy if you don't have mercy for anyone else? Didn't our Lord in this thing that the liberals think is so cute, didn't he say, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. We can't have a standard of judgment based upon the scripture for other people and then a different standard for us. That's hypocritical. That's what Jesus is picking at. Don't be a hypocrite. Have the same standard for others that you have for yourself. And if you want others to be judged by the authority of God's infallible, inerrant word, judge yourself by the authority of God's infallible, inerrant word. That passage I read in Romans 2, he says, God is not a respecter of persons. That's what it said in the KJV when I was growing up. God doesn't show partiality. I can't have a standard of judgment for the people I don't like and then another standard of judgment for the people I like. This dude I don't like committed adultery. He's a low-down, dirty dog scoundrel. This dude I like committed adultery. Oh, man, you know, it's a rough world and he's struggling through some things. Oh, you full of baloney. <laughs> Jesus said you're a hypocrite because you have different standards for different people. You can't have a standard of judgment for your enemies and a different standard for your friends, a standard of judgment, uh, ah, a standard of judgment for the donkey people and then another standard of judgment for the elephant people. Ah. You can't have a different standard of judgment for black people and white people and Asian people and Hispanic people. You can't have a standard of judgment this different for rich people and poor people. That's partiality and it's ungodly. And Jesus is picking at it. Listen to this proverb. It's Proverb 20, verse 10. Unequal weights and unequal measures are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Ha, <laughs> yeah. Christians know that homosexuality is an abomination. Hypocritically impartial, hypocritical partiality towards people is an abomination too. Different scales for different people is an abomination too. So, 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 so when we look at different public displays in our culture, we say, oh, that's offensive to God. Well, well, when you judge people differently based upon different standards, that's offensive to God too. And we need to be mindful of that. So the first thing we must do, we want to be careful about making sure we don't judge in hypocritical ways. We, can, we must be careful to not apply uneven scales, uneven measurements. Secondly, we must be careful to make sure we have mechanisms of accountability and self-evaluation in our lives. So Jesus says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, 
let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye. You hypocrite! And there's an exclamation point there in my Bible. That's why I feel comfortable yelling. <laughs> Jesus is rebuking them. When I was a kid, my dad didn't marry until I was seven. And so I spent a lot of time with my great-grandmother on my mother's side, my mother's grandmother. And on Sunday morning on the way to church, Isaac, this is one of my ministry assignments. <laughs> I'm a kid, you know, whatever, six, seven, five. She stayed in front of me. She wasn't big. She wasn't skinny. She was somewhere in the middle. But anyway, she stood in front of me. Kevin, is my slip hanging? <laughs> and so my every Sunday morning ministry assignment was to stand behind my great-grandmother and inspect things. Because <laughs> she knew. You know what's really funny? I just thought about something. A lot of these young women, they don't even know what a daggone slip is. <laughs> <laughs> like, what is he talking about? <laughs> they live in a see-through world. They don't even know what a slip is. <laughs> my grandmother, my, my great-grandmother, she knew she had some blind spots. And every Christian must realize that he or she can have blind spots. And we want to avoid a life that lacks accountability. We want to avoid a life that lacks the ability to self-evaluate. And often we need other people to help us do that. So every Christian woman should have another sister in her life that can say, you're wrong. Every Christian man should have another brother in his life who can say, you're wrong. And we ought not get all uptight about that. And you ought to make sure your friends feel the comfort level to say that. We have such a messed up understanding of relationships and friendships in our culture. You know, we friends, we buddies, we're on the same team as long as you, you always affirming me and you always agreeing with me. Don't, don't, don't say, well, what kind of mess is that? What kind of mess is that? <laughs> Y'all remember John 14? I mean, Jesus told his disciples, y'all are like developmentally challenged. Have I been so long time with y'all and y'all don't know me yet? Good grief. I said, don't, don't you know when you see me, you see the father? How? Don't tell anybody I'm y'all teacher. <laughs> Love and friendship sometimes has to confront. Do you have someone in your life? Who can confront you when you, got, when you have blind spots that you just can't see? We need to be mindful of that. Be aware that it's easy. Y'all know it's easy. It's easy to see the faults of other people. It's easy to see the faults of other people. A few years back when we were in some terrorism stuff, I was pastoring in Kentucky then. I pastored a church. Our church was red, white, and blue. And uh, I remember I came home one day, and my wife, she said, uh, I don't like terrorists. I think terrorism is wicked and evil and mean and unrighteous. And I pray for justice and I pray for righteousness. She said, but baby, you like really, 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 really mad up there. <laughs> she said, because I'm always, I'm always saying, Hey, Paul used to be a terrorist. God can change anybody. She said, but I just haven't heard you, like, say that in a while. You really, really, 
really, really mad up there. I was like, oh. I mean, I first did that husband flex. What you talking about, woman? <laughs> that was just my husband flex. As soon as she said it, I already knew. Ping, ping, pop, bullseye, ping. <laughs> I mean, like, when's the last time I played a pray to Paul prayer, a Saul to Paul prayer? Like, Lord, please change some of these wicked people. I've been praying that. I've been praying the... Osama bin Laden, Lord, let our sharpshooters find them right between the forehead. I've been, I've been, I was all in that David imprecatory mode. And my wife said, pop, pop, pop. You got to have somebody in your life that can just tell you, hey, you need to check that. That might be ungodly. And you need to be able to receive that. Not only do we need to make sure we have self-evaluation and we have accountability because it's so easy for us to see the faults of other people rather than our own faults. Also, people, remember who he's talking to. These are people who possess the law. People with religious habits are particularly susceptible to feeling self-righteous in a secularizing, pagan, unbelieving world. So the culture is so culture gone wild, the society is so society gone wild that it's easy for these people who have the covenants and the law and the religious rituals and the Sabbaths and the feasts, it's easy for them to feel like, yes, 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 we do these things and we are very right with God. Not necessarily. Jesus told some of these same people, yeah, y'all look good on the outside, but on the inside you full of dead men's bones. Jesus told these same people, man looks on the outward appearance, but God examines the heart. And so understand that our religiosity, our Christian commitments can make us slow to self-evaluate in the midst of a pagan culture because surely I'm better than this secularizing pagan culture. Not necessarily in the eyes of God. It's stinky in Romans 1. And it's stinky in Romans 2. And we need to, rat, we need, we, we, we need to sit with that when we're evaluating things. He says in verse 6, Do not give dogs what is holy and do not cast your pearls before swine lest they trample you underfoot and t lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you all biblical teaching most biblical teaching when you're pressing in on people's ethics is risky teaching that's why i am actually very 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 happy to do this for your pastor it's risky teaching i'm literally getting getting ready to go to the down the highway and go to the airport so I literally have no opportunity for any of y'all to give me any attitude. So <laughs> it was a good move for Pastor Ronnie. This is uphill preaching. This is uphill teaching. Because Jesus says in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, and he's not just talking about this passage right here where he's talking about judging hypocritically. Remember, five, six, seven is a unit. So he's saying like everything that I've been teaching y'all, trying to correct your nominal hypocr hypocritical lightweight commitments to God, it, 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 it's uphill teaching because many times some of y'all are going to be prone to reject it because he says you can't give dogs what is holy. You can't cast your pearls before swine because they will reject it. Not only will they reject it, and then they will turn and attack the messenger. Hey, you being hypocritical about something. I ain't no hypocrite. You are, blah, 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 and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. That does happen. And so Jesus says, this is uphill teaching. Dogs and pigs, which is just referring to like outsiders from the covenant people who are the descendants of Jacob, what we would say Gentiles, dogs and pigs is just their negative way of describing Gentiles. They won't receive it. But that's true with all 
all biblical teaching. And so I hope this finds some soft hearts. I hope this finds some fertile ground. I hope because it's uh, in the word, this is how my grandmother used to say it. I hope because it's in the red letters, you'll pay attention to it. <laughs> That's bad hermeneutics, but my grandmama said it. Oh, I'm sorry for you young people. Uh, Bibles used to have the words of Jesus in red. <laughs> I know y'all know that. I know y'all know that. Y'all know it's a lot of bad stuff going on in our culture. We need to stand for the sanctity of marriage and the family. One man, one woman for life. Two sons, a daughter, and we raised two nephews, so I'm a girl dad. We need to stand for the biblical truth in Genesis that God made male and female in his image. I enjoy my daughter playing volleyball. We're girls. I enjoy my daughter running track. We're girls. I enjoy my daughter playing basketball. We're girls. I enjoy my daughter playing softball. We're girls. We need to stand for that kind of stuff. We need to stand against greed and corruption. We need to stand against arrogance and pride. If all men and women are created in the image and likeness of God, we need to stand against racism and sexism and classism. But Jesus says in doing those things, if you're representing the kingdom of God, if you're representing the word of God, if you're representing the lordship of Christ, hey, what is your true confession? Jesus is Lord. Then he says you can't do those things. You can't take those stances hypocritically or you undercut the power of the gospel. Mm. Matthew 7, he makes it under say, hey, what y'all doing is not pleasing to God. In, in Romans 2, we get the insight is not only is it not pleasing to God, it undercuts unbelievers' ability to trust in God because we're making God a mockery to them. That's a weighty thing. So let me just encourage you. Approach sin and approach your evaluation and your judgment of things, realizing just that simple truth of Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we never deal with another person standing in that condescending role of a Pharisee looking down on some piece of garbage, what will be called a dog or a pig in verse 6. You dog, you pig. We never do that. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And wherever a person is, we also remember that all, any person, is able to repent of sin and turn to the cross of Jesus Christ. John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When John is saying that, he's saying that to Nicodemus, a Jew in John chapter 3, and saying, hey, God loves all kinds of people, and God has died for all kinds of people, not just the descendants of Jacob. And so I would encourage you, interact with an unbelieving, pagan, sin-loving world in a way that you can speak the good news of Jesus Christ to them and maybe participate in them turning from sin and repenting and trusting in the cross of Jesus Christ. But also, in here, interact with brothers and sisters in Christ in such a way that you can help them look at themselves and where we need do John 1 Nine, 1 John 1, 9 together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The law of God is good for judging and convicting the sinner, the unbeliever, and asking them to repent and trust Jesus. The law of God is good for helping believers Critique the man or the woman in the mirror whose teeth they're brushing. 
and ask them to repent and not turn to God for salvation, but turn to God for forgiveness and cleansing. We can't do it in hypocritical ways. And God knows the difference. I don't want to cause anyone to stumble as they consider the path to Jesus Christ. I've often, when I was raising my kids, I should tell them Romans 2, 24 is one of the scariest verses in the Bible to me. The name of God is blasphemed among the heathen because of you. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I used to hear my unbelieving relatives knowing all the garbage about church folk. It wasn't just the garbage. It was that they had the garbage, but they were walking around like they were Moses' assistant. And Jesus is calling that out. Everything that you think is sinful in our culture is sinful. And the answer to it is repentance and trust in Jesus. Not just Christians saying, ah, that's sinful. I don't like that. Ah. That doesn't do anything. It doesn't bother our unbelievers. They don't like you and care about you anyway. So what? Take what you think is sinful and shove it somewhere. But if something is sinful and we tell people of a good news Savior who desires to save them and deliver them from that sin, that might be a different kind of conversation. When y'all have an evangelistic conversations, if people talk about hypocrisy in the church, don't ever feel like you need to do to defend the church. Because everything they say about us is true. We don't declare the church. We don't declare church folk to people. We declare Jesus to people. We don't declare salvation in church folk. We declare salvation in Christ. His people in the Old Testament were shaky. His people in the New Testament are shaky. His people in West Palm Beach and Charlotte today can sometimes be shaky. But he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And it is his desire to save sinners. Uh, I got to get out of here. I pay attention in the first service because I know the second service is coming. Second service, you get a little slouchy because there ain't no service after this. But <laughs> This is our desired end. In Matthew 7, those religious leaders, their desired end was, hey, you unbeliever who does not have the law of God and your life is filthy, I want you to know I think your life is filthy. At Christ's community, any engagement we would have with an unbeliever who's living a sinful life, any engagement we would have with somebody far from Christ who's living a sinful life, the desired end of our conversation is for the conversation to go to, in such a way that at some point, I can remember a conversation I had with someone about their sinful life, but since I was not condescending, since I was not hypocritical, since I had some good news to the midst of that conversation about Jesus Christ, I now find myself watching that person be baptized as a new believer who desires to identify with Jesus Christ and follow him as Lord. That's the desired end we have. God bless you.